Welcome to the UOUC Talk Show. Our goal is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today we have Dr. Carlos Torelli. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, the, the last time we talked was almost a year ago. And one of the things that I always wanted to, to ask you and, and keep the conversation going was about the forces of uh, individualism and collectivism. So I do want to know, given how much things are, have changed in the last year, what are the, like, what is the story that both the individualistic forces as well as the collectivistic forces are telling us about the future of globalization and humanity? Well, that's a very, very broad and interesting question. You know, one of the things that I think uh, the pandemic has brought to our attention is how much solving problems require coordinated effort. And, and there is where the idea of individualism and collectivism as cultural orientations that facilitate or not, or facilitate more or less collective coordination becomes really important. In a recent research that we have conducted, for instance, has shown that uh, countries that were more collectivistic were more successful at controlling the pandemic because they were more capable of mobilizing collective effort to control the spread of the virus. So as we go forward uh, with all the issues that the world is facing, more and more coordination is really critical. And under that scenario, uh, the, the, the collectivistic forces are, are showing to be very useful you know, for a society. And, you know, societies, when we say that are more or less individualistic or collectivistic, it's not like then people are either or. You know, these are things that we all have in ourselves. You know, we're, we all have an independent or individualistic self and an interdependent or collectivistic self. It's just to what extent we mobilize one or the other. That's what sometimes really it's the key. And what we're seeing is that, that to solve these collective problems, mobilizing the collective self be becomes really, really critical. So... In that context, you know, to, to tackle those serious problems that humanity is facing, definitely collectivism uh, uh, needs to be f brought to the fore so that people kind of gather and band together. You know, to give you an example, the whole idea of discussion about whether to wear masks or not to wear masks. It, it, it was, you know, when you think in a collectivistic terms, then what you think is, well, you know, if everybody thinks that wearing a mask is a good idea, then I'm part of that collective. Then I wear a mask. It's really no, there is no, no discussion around it. But if you frame that as, okay, whether I wear a mask or not is my individual choice and nobody should be imposing it on me, then, you know, it's a choice. I might or might not do it. But one thing we knew early in the pandemic is that wearing a mask was really, really critical. So then to solve that problem of this controlling the spread of the virus, wearing a mask, societies that were more uh, uh, successful at getting people to wear a mask fare better. So that's the aspect. And in many cases in individualistic societies, you know, then governments try to incentivize the collectivistic self and say, you know, do it for the good of society, do it for the good of the people around you. But still, you know, there were issues to really make people go in that direction. So individualism and collectivism, they, they, they both have advantages as cultural orientation that foster something. But in the context of these global problems that are becoming increasingly difficult to solve individually, really collectivism is showing to be an important force. Yeah, I do, I do think something that I find really interesting is that, like you said, collectivism, when it works, we can actually achieve what we want to achieve collectively a lot faster. But sometimes this collective force could be wrong. And are you familiar with the term you know, wisdom of crowds and, and madness of crowds? And I feel like, well, you know, sure, like, you know, wearing masks could, you know, could be said that, you know, if, we, if, if, you, if everyone wears it, then we prevent the spread of COVID, for example. But in other cases, we've seen that we actually may be seeing, like, how do we know whether we're seeing madness of crowds or wisdom of crowds? Have you thought about that question? Well, you know, I haven't thought much about it, but definitely, uh, you know, what's good or bad is always a relative thing. It depends on, you know, who, who, is, who benefits from what's going on. 
Uh, you know, I try always to say it's not like this is good or this is bad. This is just more capable of solving certain type of issues versus other types of issues. So in the context of coordination, definitely collectivism provides an edge. But of course, then what you do with the collective effort could be good or bad for somebody, right? So in some cases, collective efforts have been uh, very detrimental for certain groups. You know, many wars that have been, that have been fought uh, by claiming that a group needs to impose something on an inferior group has really leveraged or hardened collectivism for our goal. But we could argue very, very badly that, that those were misguided goals because they were imposing something on others. And that's sometimes the peril of how do you mobilize collective action. Uh, but, you know, for those who were on top, it might have been a good thing. Uh, but for those who were dominated, it wasn't definitely a good thing. So it's really, uh, uh, you know, I rarely tried, I, I, I tried to avoid putting uh, a, a judgment value to what is done. I'm just, mm, I just refer to it as the ability of the collective self to help people coordinate, to make it easier to coordinate action and mobilize. Of course, the independent self has its benefits too. It, it allows creativity. And it allows for you to pursue things that perhaps others think is stupid or is, uh, or is not important. Um, and that's very, very useful for many other goals, you know, particularly goals related to economic development, innovation. Uh, you know, the greatest innovations come from people who thought differently. And by definition, in their societies, they might have been outcasts. They might have been people that were, were actually perhaps marginalized. Uh, nonetheless, they persisted and then they, they created something some very different. You know, when the world was flat and, and, and somebody said that the world was round, that sounded like a completely crazy idea. And, you know, you could have been killed by saying that, and he was about to be killed by saying that. But nonetheless, he persisted, he continued, and, and then he, he really brought us to that level. So, again, is that good? Yes, definitely good, but also, People in individualistic things have done crazy stuff. So I think the idea of whether it's good or bad, it's, it depends on the eye of the beholder. I try to be agnostic about that and just try to say, okay, what is it that this cultural orientation, this, this, this motivations to behave according to one type of, of self versus the other helps societies to accomplish? And, you know, we've developed quite a bit. Should we develop more? Certainly. It never hurts. You know, it, it's great not to have an iPhone, but to have perhaps an iPhone that is inserted in my brain and that I don't have to push any button. I just think and talk and see a holographic image. Awesome. That'd be awesome. But having that compared to a world that's going to be, you know, devastated by global warming, well, I guess having the holographic iPhone in my brain is less important than really tackling this problem. So I think uh, the level of development that society has accomplished uh, never stops. Of course, through development, we might really solve global warming with some magic pill, perhaps. But most likely, until we don't develop a technology that, that tackles global warming completely, what we need is just collective effort. And many of the problems that we're facing nowadays in society is just problems that require collective effort. So that's why you see you know, a lot of push toward more you know, collective action, more thinking about, you know, how do you fit with others and how, what can you do to solve the problems. And, you know, from what I've learned, and, and, and of course, I, I do want to know what you think about, like, of, you know, how you know, many years of research and, and just talking to people and learning a lot, is that there seems to be some people believe that we, we are going through an era of stagnation of technology, especially since the 1970s, so about 50 years of, like, technological stagnation. And one of the things that they say is that, we're not seeing the, this idea of the individual quote-unquote genius. This person who thinks differently and just able to literally just like go against the madness of crowds and develop this technology per se. Do you think that idea uh, still like could exist today or why do you think we haven't, I mean, or do you think that the idea of this individual person is able to go through against everyone and create this massive innovation and development? I think that's still doable. I think that what happens is becoming harder and harder to come with the new thing that's really going to be revolutionary. 
uh, you know, we have advanced so much that, that, that what is radical, it's becoming more difficult to envision. Uh, you know, we went from in the last, really, when we think about the development of humankind, the acceleration has happened, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, you know, in the 19th century. Now we're talking what? 250, 300 years of thousands of years humans have been around doing stuff. You know, if we go back to the Egyptians thousands of years ago, well, they were building pyramids that were really amazing. You know, we're still figuring out how they did it. Uh, but in the last 200 years, the pace of advance has been so fast, so unimaginable, that then thinking what's going to be the next revolutionary thing becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, um, so the amount of knowledge that we have nowadays is just so vast that it's really hard for anybody to kind of acquire a lot of knowledge to really put all of that together in their brains to kind of develop something new. So that's why many of those things are happening more at the organizational level, not so much at the individual genius, but the, the, the organizational genius or the, the organization that, that can harness collective minds that each have different knowledge that then can be put together, find synergies and develop something new. Uh, so I think the whole idea of the genius, uh, it's not like it's gone. It's like, well, well, this genius has to be, you know, like a super, 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 super genius. You know, Newton was a genius. Einstein was a genius. But what you need right now to become like them at the time is like, well, what brain can really manage all that information, all the things that need to be known? So, so many, the, the collective, the, 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 the collective, Intelligence is, is one of the terms that is emerging as, as more critical. And at the organizational level, there's where we're finding really the critical innovations. Organizations that have multiple disciplinary type of geniuses that then interact with each other, exchange ideas, and then are able to develop something that is really novel. Two things on that. So you said, and I, I, I agree with you, you know, uh, Richard Hammond, uh, he, he was a mathematician and he actually used to work at Bell Labs and he would say that knowledge doubles every, about every 17 years. And of course, that was before the internet, so I'm sure that's a lot lower now. So, and he would say that, okay, knowledge doubles 17 years. That means there's a lot of stuff that we need to learn in order to make progress. And he would say, okay, we have one path and that is hyper-specialization. Let's say that if you want to become an advanced field of math, do math and only math as a way to maybe even try to advance the field. Or he would say new methods to, to learn things, which is a, is a question I've been thinking about and I'm not actually know the answer, but I'm a little bit skeptical of the collective genius in a sense, because you know we, we say that, okay, there's, a, there's so much progress and development and, and sure, but People who, who believe that there is a technological stagnation, they say that, take out the computer technology, how do you know you're not living in the 1970s, for instance? And from this room that we're here, or from, let's say from your office, take out the computer, take out your phone, how do you know you're not living in the 1970s? Which is an interesting question because... Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting question, but I think, you know, if you take no, not the computer. You take my iPhone, and I'm, I'm, I'm dumb. You know, I don't know my phone number. You know, my, my cell phone number, I know. I don't know my home office phone number, my my office phone number. You know, there is a lot of stuff that we now rely on things. You know, in the past we have relied on different things, but computers and and information is is, is now something that you know. I think our brain has been recalibrated to not encode certain type of information that in the past was critical to be encoded. And now what we do is we, we have freed up a little bit our memory capacity and our processing capacity in our own brains to just do some other things. Like I don't memorize many things that in the past were important to be memorized uh, because I know they are at the fingertips. Um, and the amount of information we have access to is just so vast that then that in itself, it's a little bit of a way of collective intelligence. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm 
when I'm doing research, I remember when I was a PhD student, you know, and if I wanted to know what was new, I would go to the, to the library and I would then read the journals and, you know, started to be some stuff online. Some, very few things, but no books were online. Journal articles starting to be published online, the new ones, the old, they were still kind of, you have to go to the library. That wasn't 100 years ago, that was 16, 17 years ago. Now, almost everything is online. Whether you have access to depends on, you know, your, on, on what university you are that gives you more access to stuff. But then the access to knowledge that we have nowadays is, is just tremendous. So the amount of things we can learn about, research about very selectively, drill down on a topic and go really, 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 really granular to what everybody has done around that little thing, uh, it's, it's something that we couldn't do in the past. And um, I think that's the nature of a lot of what happens nowadays is, is the ability that, that, that people have to access vast amounts of data or information to then make decisions. That in itself is an advancement, I think, that, that, that's changing how we view things. And sometimes it's changing it for the good, sometimes changing it for bad, because in a way we're becoming dumber. So, okay, if there's an algorithm that predicts X, X is going to happen. You know, the example of, of the movie, Don't Look Up, you know, that there's the guy that has all this data and, and, and tells the, the, the president, uh, you're going to be eaten by a whatever. I don't know what's that. I have no idea. That's what the model says. And then, yeah, at the end of the movie, she's eaten in an alien planet by <laughs> some sort of a dinosaur-like thing. Well, but that, that's a little bit like a dumb prediction. You know, there's no really reason why you would predict that. It's just like an algorithm is doing something. So in a way, we don't need to think. Let the algorithm tell us what, what's going to happen or what we should do. Well, that's really, that's really risky. And that's really, well, what do we need humans for in a way? I don't believe that, that, that a world ruled by algorithms is going to be kind of the ultimate thing. But nonetheless, these are useful tools that have changed the way we operate. So even if you know, the physical world is very similar compared to the 70s or the 80s, uh, although the, the iPhone wasn't in the 70s, and definitely it's a big difference, uh, the access to information in itself is a thing. You know, I, I, I love dystopian movies. Uh, that, that's, that's a passion of, 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 of me. And you know, one of the things is that we take for granted Sicilian things that we assume we know how we m make them. But, you know, when all these movies about world collapses and everything is, is gone, well, you know, how do we make a bottle? How do we, I have no idea how we make it. But in the internet, we can find how we make it. So even in, in those dystopian situations in which the world collapses, if we have the World Wide Web and all the computers safe somewhere, well, we humans, with access with that, as long as we have electricity or some form of energy to access that, should be able to replicate anything. Because we have the, in a way, the knowledge is somewhere. But in, in all these movies, what happens is that, you know, if, if, if material things are destroyed, then, then if we don't have the factors, then we, don't, we cannot do anything. We cannot replicate the factors because we don't have a clue how they were made. So, so the whole access to information is in, is in itself a very powerful thing. Um, it's funny that you mentioned Don't Look Up because I saw that movie a few weeks back and I, I've been thinking a lot about the metaphor like that's hidden behind the movie and how they're trying to like replicate or in a way show what might happen. Like the meteor is a metaphor for, for climate, climate change, change, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. Or the war in Ukraine. You pick your... Yeah. Your Anything, collective yeah. disaster that's ahead of us. Right. Yeah. So um, one, one thing that struck out in that movie is that technology, like the role technology had on, on convincing people because the entire like, premise of the, the U.S. government in that movie was that don't look up. And they were, they were looking at their own materialistic benefits. Mm -hmm. And technology had a huge role to play in it because people would share it on their social media and like talk about it and that in a way like affected like so many minds around the world and in a way you can say that's the spread of misinformation. So something that I'm curious to know about from you is that 
how do you think technology plays a role in collectivism versus individualism? Like, how do you think technology today is affecting this collective mindset of the people around the world? And do you think it's a good thing or like where we're heading? Is it like a good place or a bad place? I said, this is a very interesting question. You know, what I would say is that, again, I, I think about technology provide tools. Right. You know, technology enables us to do things. Then again, then the question is, how do we organize ourselves mm -hmm. to use that? And one of the things that's happening that's really scary in collectivistic societies is that then what they are, some of these societies are planning is to use technology to really control everything that happens at the societal level. You know, the, the, the whole big brother thing that started in the United States, you know, many years ago, you know, ideas of, of a, a big government controlling everything. That, that's something that in China is pretty much what happens. Uh, and what they have realized is that when you, as a collective, decide that you're going to use technology to really organize the collection of individuals the way you think it should be, well, it becomes really scary what could happen with technology in those societies. And you know, in places like China, pretty much, if you do something wrong, you could be ostracized for life. It's like pretty much what they have is some sort of a version of an algorithm in which every human being in those societies is ranked according to how you behave. And you know, there are points against you, in favor of you, and there are some points that really give you like, you're, you're put in jail, uh, not necessarily in physical jail, but like uh, you don't get anything, you don't get resources, you don't get access to jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's promoted in the service of the benefit of the group. It's like, you know, then we are controlling the group and the group can then move faster in a direction. Of course, that direction might be self-destructive at the end of the day, but we, don't, we might not realize it as a society. Whereas in individualistic societies, we don't have that risk. Actually, what we have is the opposite. We have like a lot of, of, of we're very uh, vigilant with what technology can do. And then to an extreme that is sometimes even not very enabling, you know, innovation and things. Because if everything is a privacy concern, then, then you know, what can we do? You know, we cannot, we cannot, we know, don't do this, don't do that, because you might violate some privacy law, some, so it's, it's the other extreme. But to a certain degree, it's funny that the whole Big Brother thing, although might have been conceptually, might have emerged from a more individualistic place, is really kind of the reality in a more collectivistic environment nowadays. So I, I always think about technology as the tool that allows humans to, you know, do things faster, better, better quality of life, etc. Then. You know, societies pick and choose how they use it again, depending on their overarching goals. Right. So, would you say, like, should we think of technology from an individualistic perspective, like just just approach, or um, when you're thinking about the future, instead of having a collective idea about how technology should be, should we be more cautious and approach it with more individualistic ideas than? A collective like what others think about and like let's say Apple comes out with new products every year and everyone just rejoices at how how much how much convenient it's making everyday lives right but no one's questioning how that's affecting our individual lives so would you say that approaching this from a personal standpoint is better than think seeing what how it's affecting everyone and how happy everyone is, and then just accepting the technology as good. Well, again, I think I think there's always that there's there's always a, a positive side and a negative okay. side. So I, I think that that technology is certainly enabling us to be happier, to be more efficient, to you know we can control our calories intake and then be be more fit, be healthier. Uh, at the same time, is allowing us to coordinate more, if that's what we want to do, you know, from a collectivistic standpoint. Uh, so I, I don't see it as, you know, either or, or that's going to be good, it's going to be bad. It, it's a mixed bag. What I think is might be happening right now is that we're focusing too much on the next technological thing, right. and we're forgetting that we're living in a world 
that's, that's plagued with problems that have nothing to do with technology, that have a lot to do with you know, disparities, with issues with overconsumption, with issues of you know, overhedonism. Uh, but the next technological thing is really feeding into these problems right. because we become less worried about stuff. Like, you know, we vaguely assume that the past iPhone that we replace is recycled somehow. But I don't think many people know really what happens with that. I don't know well. I know that we try to take things out of it, but I don't know if 50%, 60% goes to waste. The same with anything you know, we wear or use. And then the more we use and consume, the more we're contributing to problems with pollution and with, again, you know, with global warming because we use energy and, you know, energy, yeah, sometimes we, we drive, you know, our, our electric cars and we think that we're contributing to the environment, but we don't know that, you know, we plug in to charge the electric car and, you know, what's coming, it's, it's just might be, might be, you know, so fossil fuel exactly. consumption. So, but, but we still think that that technology is, is working. So I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is that too much focus on technology by itself, it, it, it's, it's reaching to a point in which that's the incremental, the marginal benefit that that's bringing society is, is not as high compared to the cost for society and the, the lack of attention to problems that are more pressing. Uh, and that's the part that, that I think, uh, you know, right now when we see the issue going on in, in the war, uh, 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 the invasion of Ukraine, you know, it's kind of, it's like a wake-up call. All of a sudden, could we, have, could we have a World War III? Well, you know, some people say that we are in the verge of World War III. Like, like we are like, just like when World War II started, it didn't start just uh, all of a sudden. It started with this kind of skirmishes and this kind of things, and then eventually it evolved into that. You know, what if we were to go in that direction? Well, that'd be a big disaster for humanity. Then all these conversations about technology would be completely irrelevant. So, and, and I think that's kind of, we've been for many, many years just focusing too much on, on, on how we personally advance our agendas, how we make our life more comfortable, forgetting that there are these other myriad of problems that have nothing to do with that, that are so basic and we're not, just not paying attention to them and they are now knocking at our doors to say, okay, look at me, we have these issues that we need to solve. Right, and talking about technology would like, we cannot talk about technology without talking about consumerism, like which is something that we're seeing more and more every day and and like there's so much behind consumerism in which how like the industry is function and how they're marketing their products, but also how the people are just, it's, it's like a feedback loop. The more people consume, the more incentivized the companies would be to make more products and the more they sell. And so it just ends with the feedback loop. So where do you think we're heading in terms of consumerism? And are you, are you optimistic um, in terms of whether, like we, we know that consumerism isn't, isn't sustainable and we're gonna run out of resources eventually. And many people still don't realize their consumeristic uh, behavior, or maybe it's hard for them to overcome those because they're just used to this. Like on the click off a button, they can just order something from Amazon and it'll be there on the doorstep like in a day. So there's so many things right now which are incentivizing consumerism, but how, how can we, is there something that can be done to maybe in a way curb that consumerism so that the, the upcoming few years could, could be more sustainable or better? And you know, and, and, you know, and like in a way, it, it's, it's a question of the business models. So with that in mind. Well, that's, that's uh, the million dollar question, right? Uh, you know, in, in a way, what you start, you know, companies, are oriented toward profit maximization. And we know that there's been a push in the last years towards trying to think also more socially conscious about things. And, 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 and that's right now kind of a, of a, there's a tension. And although almost all companies are trying to embrace some version of being socially conscious, 
Still, the profit maximization is at the end of the day what my rule. And what makes more likely that a company is going to move more toward, okay, this might be something that's not good in the short term, but it's the right thing and it might be good in the long term, is that there are consumers that are willing to support that. And we see more and more of that happening. So that's, that's positive. That's a good thing. Nonetheless, that's still, I would say, that a minority. So I don't think this is a widespread thing in which, you know, mainstream consumers are so conscious about these issues that they decide to reward companies in mass that think that's this way, that think, okay, my stock price might go down this year because I'm doing this because that's for the benefit of the greater good. Well, if the stock price goes down, chances are that the board of directors is going to remove the CEO and then that idea just, just collapses. But we're seeing more and more f examples of companies that are able to manage a little bit better through that tension. So in that regard, there is a certain level of optimism. You know, I, I, I want to be optimistic. Uh, but still, you know, that's conversations that happen in the developed world. In the less developed world, that's not the problem. The problem is how do I survive? You know, how do I find, how do I put food on the table? No matter how. If I have to kill a rhinoceros to take, you know, the, the or, or an elephant to take the tusk, well, either I do that or I die or I don't have food to give my family. It's very easy to say you're not going to kill the elephant. Of course, here we say, you know, these people are killing elephants. How come they do it? Of course, for us it's easy because we have food on the table, shelter, everything. So this, this disparities and these problems that, that uh, as time goes by are becoming sharper because of global warming in many cases, you know, famines in Africa because, you know, weather patterns, uh, there are no crops, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the discussion there is forget about it. Uh, I, this idea of depletion of resources, etc. cetera, that, 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 that's a dream. So, and there is where I don't see the urgency. And there is where uh, we, we, we see those issues, we say, yeah, but still, you know, that's kind of not my immediate problem. My immediate problem is something else. There's where I'm a little bit pessimistic. You know, the, the, there are these two trends kind of coexisting at the same time. And, and you know, which one's going to prevail? It's the, the pay more attention to, you know, solving all these global issues, making sure that then we can somehow all move together forward versus, yeah, I try to optimize my thing. That's... You know, I, I don't have a crystal ball to say which, which one is going to win, but uh, they're, they're the two tendencies. So, in a way, I'm optimistic. In another way, I'm not that optimistic. We'll, I guess we'll see as, as years go by. But, but there is certainly a push, uh, particularly among young consumers, right. to think more along those lines, to think more, okay, we've we got to be conscious. You know, we cannot live in the, then the, what we consume, we consume it differently. Um, you know, this is nothing really new. This idea of, you know, we change our clothing every year is relatively new. You know, in the past, 30, 40 years ago, 80 years ago, you know, people would have, you know, a set of clothes that would last for four or five years. But now, you know, everything is kind of disposable. You know, the quality of clothing nowadays, it really doesn't matter which brand it is. This stuff doesn't last much. You know, this shirt I'm wearing, you know, might last, I don't know, 10 washings. After that, it's kind of useless. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. You know, the quality of things were a lot higher. Then I would stay with this for many, many years. And then I wouldn't be changing clothing every year. But now we're used to that. So we're becoming more and more conscious of not doing that. And there are business models built around that. You know, brands like Patagonia that, you know, get yeah, their expensive uh, jackets. but you know, they're supposed to last forever. You know, and they guarantee for, I don't know if it's for life or for many, many years, 10, 20 years. And what's the idea of, well, I shouldn't change my jacket every year? Well, how, how come? Uh, I want to change it. I want to have more, you know, hedonistic pleasure by having a new jacket. But that's damaging the environment. So then 
many consumers are really willing to pay more for a jacket that's going to last for longer. Yeah. But is that majority? No. So there's where I say there is a trend, particularly among the young. So there is hope, but still, you know, the majority of the world, I don't think, is fully there. You know, we all have our hedonistic pleasures. What are some of yours? Oh, boy. That's a good question. What are my hedonistic pleasures? You know, probably the biggest one is food. I love food. Um, I'm crazy about authentic food. So there I don't, I really go the extra mile to try to recreate or try things. Uh, I'm not a big fan of durable things. So, you know, if you see videos of me teaching, you might see the same shirt. because so I think I haven't changed in like in three or four years. I have the same set. So I try, I'm, I'm not a big, a big fan of, of, of durable goods. I am a fan of hedonistic experiences. Traveling, food, yeah, there is, there is no limit. You know, I could go 100 times to Florence and I would still love going to Florence. I've been to Florence, I think, two or three times, no, three, three times. And every time I go, I enjoy it the same. And the same with food. So those are my, my hedonistic things, it's the experiences, and particularly traveling and, and eating. Eating good food. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, what's something that you, you used to strongly believe that you realized later that you were fundamentally wrong about? Goodness. Something I believed. Like, very strongly. Very strongly. That I don't think is going to happen anymore or Goodness, you know, there, there is things I believed about the world that I want to believe is not true anymore. I'm not sure it is not true anymore, but you know, I always used to believe that we were destined at the end for self-destruction. That, that's always something always that at a point in time, I wasn't sure it was going to be me or my kids, but the whole Malthusian theory of where are where too many people on earth and there are limited resources. It's always resonated with me. For a long while, I started to believe that with technology, we really solve that problem. You know, the whole idea that the world still have mm, you know, limitless resources seems kind of okay. But, you know, lately I'm starting to worry more about that. So. That was something that when I was young, I remember reading some of these uh, Malthusian theories and thinking, goodness, could it be me that I'm going to be the end of the world? Uh, then eventually I thought, no, this is definitely something that's not going to happen, that the world, you know, humankind is capable of addressing multiple problems. And, you know, we, through technology, we now produce more food than we did before. You know, we have genetically engineering foods that are more resistant to to, to diseases and, you know, that need less water. You know, I'm still hopeful that we're going to find some technology that's going to capture carbon from the atmosphere and eventually pack it into something that then perhaps we can even eat it or who knows what. Perhaps I'm going to see it or not. But lately, I'm started to be less optimistic about, about the world because, you know, you start seeing too many trends popping up you know, authoritarian tendencies that are becoming more and more common, something that we thought was something of the past, that we definitely turned that corner, we're not going back to that, and we're now going in circles and coming back to that, that starting, you know, those old beliefs starting to come back, but I still want to be, because of my kids, I still want to be optimistic, and I want to think that, you know, we have a future of, again, hundreds of years ahead of us as a prosperous, species that's going to still, you know, keep the world going. You know, you have kids and children, and as a dad, you want them to create 
for them a world that is safe and peaceful where they where their dreams can you know become true in a way and that you, you say that and I think it's generally true that we're always focused on the next technology like in a way it's kind of like consumerism in a way we're always looking for the next thing we, we don't we're not really asking the questions that we should perhaps be looking at like you said so what are some of the things that you said they're sort of like knocking on our door hey come look at me that we should be looking at, thinking about. What do you think, like, what are those things that we should be thinking about? You mentioned, you know, issue with, uh, with governments. I remember the last time we talked, we talked about how the number of people who are getting PhDs are usually people who their parents have PhD, like PhDs already, which are creating more disparities and stuff like that. What are some things that are knocking on our doors? Come look at me, come look at me. But we're trying to ignore them, almost like on purpose. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think, and I'll mention this throughout the conversation a little bit here and there, you know, it's, it's these disparities that are right now, you know, the world is a lot more unequal today than it was, you know, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, particularly in the United States, uh, the disparity is just, is just outstanding. And I don't have a solution for that. I really don't know exactly. It's not my area of expertise. You know, that's not what I do research. Uh, but one thing I, I always uh, tell my kids is that, you know, it's important that you pay attention to what's happening around you and you open your eyes to, you know, these big social issues and try not to just look the other way. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, you need to commit wholly to solve them, you know, because for some people that might be a calling, but for others it might not be. But you shouldn't be completely, uh, uh, you know, like completely not pay attention to them. You need to be conscious that we're living in a very complex world in which we are very fortunate uh, to have things that, that in many other parts of the world are luxuries. And, and that's not something just to take it like, hmm, well, so be it. What can I do? It's not my fault, you know, just happened to be born here. It, it, it's a little bit not your fault, but it's a little bit your responsibility. And you know, I always try to tell my kids, through example, you need to try to work toward whatever you can do to contribute to solving at least tiny little bit some of these big problems. Uh, I don't think these are problems that can be solved by any single person. Again, I think these are collective problems that we can only solve if we work together. Uh, so I, I think the whole idea that it's not my problem, you know, I focus on my thing, that somebody else's problem used to work in the past, but I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna work for longer because these problems are really, are really screaming at us and, and, and it's really hard to ignore them anymore. Uh, Again, it's not, and I'm a marketing professor, so it's not like that's, that's my area of, of expertise. But as a, as a, as a, as a father, as a, as, a, as a friend, when I talk to people, I try always to tell them, open your eyes, open your ears, be open to see what's happening around you, because the world where you live is just a subset of the different worlds that people live in. And yours happen to be one that's extremely fortunate. And there are many other worlds that are not close at all to the world where you live in. And you shouldn't be assuming that just this is the only world that exists. Yeah, I mean, there's only 300 million people in the US out of 8 billion. So to be here, it's in a way a, a very fortunate thing. And for me, you know, I came from you know, Venezuela and I experienced what it was like to live in such country you know that could be a little challenging coming to to here i think that's where i sort of see how what a blessing it is to to be here and perhaps moving from a country like that gave me a big sense of urgency which perhaps makes me a little quote unquote crazy to work on big important problems and something i've been thinking about and really hard over the last few months is that I believe there's some way, perhaps systematically or like some theory or something, that literally any problem that we have can be achieved 
if we're able to figure out how to align incentives. The example I'd like you to think about is that a company. What is a company fundamentally speaking? You have different people from different areas who come together to achieve one goal. What did the company do or the CEO or whatever? That person was able to figure out a way to align the incentives around that goal to achieve a common goal. So how can we, like have you thought about such question? Because you mentioned incentive in, you know, in economics, incentives is everything. How can we, it's kind of a weird question to ask, but is there a way to, I, I guess like, I, the, a good, the good question would be, how can we think about the question of aligning incentives? Like, what would be a good frame to think about mm -hmm. through that such question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And some people think about these issues, you know, at the societal level. You know, how do we align incentives for citizens of a country, of a society, to really move in the direction that it's, it's for the greater good? Um, there's definitely a, a great role of incentives. You know, right now what we have is the incentive of the opposite. The incentives we have is just really to overconsume and, and, and not care about each other. Uh, just when you think about, uh, about natural resources, just to give you an example, uh, one incentive to try to save resources is to price them accordingly. Um, really, we give water for free in this country. Even in the places where water is really hard to get in, we give it almost for free. If we were to charge the cost of water, it would be completely different. You know, we build dams, we build irrigation systems, we build, you know, piping systems, everything, but we don't charge for that. It's really, you know, this is construction that happens or many of those things that are done Government does it, and then, you know, that's kind of the taxes that we pay, but we know that the taxing system, and it's very tricky to get it accurately, then some people argue, well, well why don't we, instead of, of taxing on this very broad way, we price certain things according to what they are worth. Um, and it's the same thing with pollution. You know, we use resources, and when we dispose them, and we don't pay anything for disposing them. Well, what if we were to pay for disposing them? Or not pay for disposing them, but pay upfront for consuming them so the disposal is kind of factored in there. There's where you know, you know, the carbon tax is one idea to deal with global warming. And I tell you, if you put those things, aligning incentives, you are absolutely right. That's what companies do. Companies that really succeed are the ones that are very capable of telling employees, what is it that we want you to do? You know, this is the identity of our company. This is what we want every employee to be doing, to be moving forward. And then you align reward and punishment systems that are aligned with that. Then if what you need to do is to deliver superior service to our customers, then you have to reward employees that do that. If you say, you know, what I want is superior service, but I really don't pay you what's needed to do that, or I don't reward you when you go the extra mile, then why would I do it? You know, we're all self-interested to a, to a great degree, and particularly when we're talking about what is the things that we don't like to do, but we do. You know, many of us might say that we love our jobs. Yeah, but I'd rather be on the beach. So I still have an alternative. I really like more to be on the beach than do my job. You know, I could be on the beach every day of my life and be happy but still enjoy my job, but I enjoy it because there is also a financial incentive. There are other incentives, you know, recognition. It's not only money, it can be different types of incentives. So that at the societal level, we just, we're lacking that. There is no incentive for me to live a healthy life. I do it because it kind of makes sense, but not, it doesn't make sense for everybody because really f living a healthy lifestyle is more costly when I compare it to the hedonic experience that I might have. Because if I were, I love eating, but if I were to eat everything that I love, you know, I would be overweight. And if it were to be overweight, then I'm probably going to get diabetes, heart disease, etc. And then the cost to the health system is going to be higher. So like I decide not to be, uh, not to do those things because of the cost to the health system. That's the ultimate thing in my mind, because really there's no cost. I don't pay for it directly, I pay partly. The university pays the rest and we'll pay the same thing regardless of what we do. That's, in a way, crazy from an economic point of view. 
you know, then if we were to align incentives in a society to incentivize the right behaviors and discourage the wrong ones, I think we would have a better chance. The thing is that nobody would be elected through that. So it's very difficult unless societies reach a point in which you are kind of at the abyss. Like if you don't do that, then really you're going to be in trouble. And I think, you know, most developed societies have become very complacent, very comfortable with the way things are going for, I would say, fewer but still a large group of people, not for everybody, but still for a sizable chunk. And then having these discussions of how we align incentive systems become really, really difficult. And the most basic incentive system, in a way, is the tax system. And, you know, discussions about taxes are very controversial. And nobody wants to pay tax. So, you're right. I think one potential solution to these problems is through uh, incentives. And that's what would require governments that are elected because, you know, there is consensus that we need to tackle these problems. And, yeah, I might have to change my behavior. Then, am I willing to do it? And my, my selfish, hedonistic self would say, no, I'm happy the way I am, so then why, why bother? And um, then that becomes difficult. You know, there are not too many societies that, that do that. But there are a few that are more, more successful at trying to get kind of incentives in place. Uh, implicitly, sometimes not through taxes, or, but through you know, behavioral scripts that in society are uh, transmitted that, you know, this is, this is what we should do. And then everybody kind of tries, 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 try to do it. But uh, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be a potential good solution is to put into a code, you know, charging people for really what's their pollution output and, and their, you know, they're better taking care of themselves and the environment. Um, I would say the way society is organized today, that money is one of the biggest incentives that people can work on. Um, are there any other incentives that come to your mind that that could potentially work for making these decisions, like these big relevant oh, decisions? Oh, absolutely. Social status, social recognition. You know, one of the things that societies are, are can, can reward people is to agree on who are the people that deserve recognition and, and that are valued and that are acknowledged and then enjoy a higher social status. Uh, just to give you an example, in, right now in the United States, you know, lately since the last, I would say, 15, 20 years, some of the groups that enjoy, that, that there is a big discrepancy between where they should be and where they are in terms of status, meaning recognition in the eyes of others, is teachers. Financially, um, from a status per perspective, being a teacher is really not high status. It's like, you know, I'd rather be something else. I'd rather be a salesman. I'd rather be a sales dealer. You know, I'd rather be many other things than, than being a, a school teacher. In some societies, like in Japan, being a teacher is that you're God. You are, you are like, you're like a unique college professor, which used to be more prestigious. Now a college professor, no, that's... That's not even that important, you know. I'd rather be a banker. I'd rather be a, I don't know, a, an influencer in social media than, you know, I know more than that college professor. So that's how societies also provide rewards. Granting status, recognition, respect in the eyes of others. Uh, that's collectively decided because those roles or those attitudes or those uh, behaviors that these people exhibit are worthy of elevating them just beyond a financial element, which it's also important. Also, in Japan teachers earn a lot more than they earn here in the United States. It's just an example of how societies can, where, where they put, uh, they put their, their 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 value where really things that are important to them, and then that's a way of also incentivizing behavior then, because you want people. To be role models, and you said these are the kind of role models that we want you to follow, instead of some crazy influencer that's, you know, not necessarily from lifestyle perspective, 
the best example, but in many cases, that's the person of high status in society, and then that's what suppose you should be emulating and following. Not necessarily is going to lead to good things. So yeah, there, there, there are ways of of using other types of incentives. You know, you have kids and about our age, and we're about to enter our world. Like, what advice do you have for someone who's in high school, college, we're about to enter the world, and as you said, the world's about to enter a period of uncertainty and, and always that we'll have a future where we're, we're going to have a lot of technology, hopefully, but with also a lot of problems that are not necessarily solved with technology. What advice should you do you have for them? Do you usually tell the kids? And what advice should they ignore? Well, I think one of the things that I always tell, I wouldn't say that I tell my kids that don't listen too much to what I say. I, I guess that I try to Uh, to uh, uh, spread that that view through repeated actions and repeated uh, 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 behaviors is you need to be very uh, broad in what you know about. You know, you should read a lot about many different things. You should know a lot about history. You should know a lot about the world. You should be open to different ways of doing things in different parts of the world. You should be culturally savvy. You should be culturally curious. Um, and you should be you know, well-learned about world affairs, about different customs and traditions, because that provides you with a base, first, to understand better other people, And to find patterns of behaviors and patterns of connections that you wouldn't notice otherwise. So one of one of the biggest issues that I think happens nowadays is that you know we train people, and you were saying that just before we started the conversation that you came to college and you thought you were going to be exploring new ideas, new things, and connecting with things. Uh, and then you find yourself just working on your homework and you know, reading down on how to solve this or that. That's important, but that's definitely, definitely not enough. Because not having the context where you apply that knowledge is really uh, in, the, in, the, in the current world is, is a liability. I think one of the biggest issues that we have nowadays is that people don't know history. And, and not only American history, moral history. And, you know, history provides you with patterns of cultural behaviors. You know, the problems that societies face, you know, they might be different in, the, in, 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 in terms of what's the concrete thing that's that triggering it. But the patterns are the same since, you know, ancient times in many cases. And, you know, the more novel problems, you know, similar problems we've been facing in the last two or three hundred years. And, you know, very few people know really about the history of the United States or the history of the world. You should know about that. And, 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 and then to understand world history, you need to understand culture. You need to understand how people think in different parts of the world. So being, being curious about that is also very important. So I always tell my kids, you know, you need to, you need to have breath, not only depth. Of knowledge, and I also tell that to my to my students, to my PhD students, whenever you know they are, you know, I'm a marketing researcher, uh, and I and I do research on you know global consumer behavior. But it's not the only thing I know about, you know, and I, and I and I and I read very broadly, and I try to be aware of you know most of psychological theories that are out there. I'm not aware of all, but I'm aware of many, not only the two or three that I might use to solve my problems. That breath is really, really becoming very critical. You know, as I said before, there's so much knowledge out there that you know, being a true genius nowadays is almost impossible because you cannot absorb all, all of that knowledge. But you still need to strive to be to have breadth of knowledge. Not only you know, if you're an engineer, not only know about engineering, but know about history, know about art, know about culture. Uh, doesn't mean that you have to be an expert, but it's going to allow you to then identify certain things within engineering that uh, that you wouldn't notice if you didn't have this this knowledge. Yeah, in a way, learning or the education system is about giving you context, and that's why a lot of the time 
learning in college or in an educational setting. It doesn't feel like learning because we know, like, we know you, you, everything is out there in the internet, but the school kind of gives you the content in order for where, how to apply it. So something I also think about as a way for us to find new methods of, of learning. Yeah, to end our conversation here, we actually have a little section that we call overrated, underrated. And the first question here is that you study civil engineering and then you switch to business marketing. So it's studying engineering and then doing business. Underrated or overrated? So from civil engineering to business. Meaning engineers doing business and not just business people who end up doing business. So engineering, engineers doing business. Overrated or underrated? Oh, underrated. 100%. Tell me more. So I think engineering, is, it's, uh, it opens your mind to connecting things in a way that you wouldn't, in, a, in an analytical way that you wouldn't do otherwise. So I think, uh, you know, I'm biased, I'm an engineer. So I think that the way I see things today is because I'm an engineer. If I had started as a business person, I don't think I would have the same same the same mindset to approach things the way I do. So I think it's highly underrated. You know, we, we talked a lot about the ideas of individualism. I think one person who stands out is uh, Ayn Rand. Are you, are you familiar with? No. Ayn Rand, she wrote Atlas Shrugged and Funny Head, like the this, this books. Have you heard of ever? No. Okay, well, <laughs> she, she, she's a very interesting person because a lot of people uh, use her as a, as a metaphor. And you know she's she's written like Atlas at Shrug and the front head, which are both stories of individual geniuses who went against the madness of crowds. They're able to, you know, it, I think they obviously it's fiction, but from a lot of people, it serves as a, as a way for people to see what it's like to get to go against the collectivist forces that are often depending on how you look at, it, I guess, but often wrong. So. I would I would recommend you, you you read some of his books. I, I like the the Fountainhead, so I would recommend starting there. So, next one. So the something that I, I usually um, that is a kind of a global phenomenon that is relatively new is uh, like globalization. Like globalization is very good because we're sort of connecting. We have a global customer base from a point uh, from a standpoint of starting a business, but that also makes us very dependent in other countries, and, we, and we're seeing that you know. This thing happening with Russia, it's causing issues with like some uh, like resources, and you know we see gas going up to in California almost eight dollars per gallon. So globalization as a whole, overrated or underrated? I think it's still underrated. I think what happens with globalization is that uh, uh, you know we haven't embraced fully what a global world really could be. And, you know, the ultimate thing of what a global world could be is a world in which uh, is a more, more homogeneous world in which we all kind of embrace similar sets of aspirational values that are more novel. We're definitely not there. So what we see with globalization is just struggles and things, I guess, a change of products and ideas, but not necessarily embracing them in a global mindset. So I, I, I think the whole idea of what globalization could really be, it hasn't been harnessed fully. Uh, so thinking in the ideal of globalization as this homogenization, standardization of, you know, freedom and, uh, and opportunities for all and, you know, free exchange that really make a world more fair, more just, if it's implemented in the right way, it hasn't happened. So. So thinking about that, I think is still underrated. What we see right now is something that is really not the full potential of globalization. It's just like we started to see globalization and then we saw the perils for some certain groups. Uh, and then we said, no, let's stop that because then I'm going to lose. Yeah, others that one day should win might win now and that's not good because then I'm going to, it's seeing this, if they win, I lose. And really, it's we all should be in a way winning, but some in the winning are gonna be coming from the bottom, and some are gonna be coming from the top. But we all kind of reach kind of an equilibrium, uh, but that's not happening. And because you know those who are starting to lose 
start realizing, oh, that's not good. You know, I had a very, very good life. I'm not happy just with a good life. I'd rather have a very, very good life and the rest as a really poor life. Although I say that's, I'm sorry for them when I need to really work toward, okay, I need to give up something so this get a little bit better, but we all at the end gonna be better off and we're gonna be more, you know, sharing uh, resources more equally. It's not happening. So thinking of globalization as an idea, I think it's overrated. You know, you, you mentioned the right way, and I, I don't know if you remember it, but I think the highway from uh, Maracay to Caracas, you know how, how they have like a huge, like, like in the middle, there's like a huge thing, like a, like a mm -hmm. huge hole. Yeah. And I don't I don't know exactly where, where they come from, but from what I hear, the stories from my family, like my, my granddaughter, is that the engineers who built it, the highway, were to, they went to Canada or something. And of course, in Canada, there's snow. So they, they built, they used a thing as a way to put snow. But in Venezuela, of course, we don't have snow, but we have the thing. It's just like, the, it's like the weirdest thing because it's like tropical country and we have this huge thing for, for snow, which is like the craziest thing. And it reminds me of like globalization in a way. So, you know, you mentioned uh, authentic food. And of course, I have to ask you, Venezuelan food, overrated or underrated? Oh. Big time on the race. People don't even know what is Venezuelan food. They're starting to learn. I said that one of the only few things that the, the trying to put a silver line into really the misery that the Venezuelan people is going through is that the world is now getting to really learn about Venezuelan food. And uh, is then is, is very, very much underrated. I think once people know what Venezuelan food is, you know, it, it started to become really popular. Now you find arepas everywhere that you couldn't find before. Arepas are highly, highly, highly underrated. That's the best thing on earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I would agree with you. And, you know, I may be a little biased, but I don't, I don't know. But um, thank you so much, Dr. Torelli, for you know, for coming in and talking to us and sharing so much about globalization, individualism, collectivism, and really how these forces will shape the world we live in in ways that we don't even know what. But I think it's staying adaptable and, and learning from people like you will be a good you know, step in order to make the future the future that we want. So okay. thank you so much. My pleasure. And um, thank you everyone for watching. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Torelli, please uh, put them in the comments and we'll try our best to get them answered. Um, we hope you enjoyed this conversation and um, we look forward to sharing many more ideas with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. I'm really glad you're doing this thing.